Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, I'm chatting with a man whose love of barbecue is restoring class in the Sutherland Shire. Hey family, hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. This is episode 134 of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast and in this episode we're chatting with Matt Harris from Shire Smokers. Now before we get into this episode, I do have a couple of announcements that I want to run by you. The first is I want to give a huge thank you to our podcast partner for today's episode. It's Meat and Fire Media Services. So if you need photography, videography, um, if you need some help with your brand building through digital media, they are running a, a course at the moment, brand building through strategic social media marketing. And if you use the code word podcast at checkout, you'll save a hundred bucks off that course. So big thanks to them and do check that out. They are offering uh, business services to help out your business. The next announcement is that we do have our free mini ebook available for you over on the Smoking Hot Confessions website. It's our beginner's guide to real barbecue. So if you're at the start of your barbecue journey, you want to learn a bit more about it, head on over there, check it out. A pop-up window is going to appear, put your details in there and we'll shoot it through to your inbox. Next, if you're not there yet, do come and join us at the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community on Facebook. It's a great group. We've set it up there. It's all just about barbecue. All the guff is left at the door. So if you want to just hang out with some nice, friendly people and just simply talk about barbecue, this is the right place for you. So do check us out in there. Now, of course, if you are watching this on YouTube, do give us a thumbs up, a subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, give us a like and a share. And if you've got any questions for either Matt or myself, pop them in the comments and we'll make sure we get back to you as quick as we can. If you're watching this on Instagram, make sure that you give us a little uh, love heart and a follow. And if you've got any questions, pop them in there as well. And if you're listening on a podcasting app, do give us a five-star rating and review, particularly if you're watching on Apple. Not too sure how it works, but it does boost us up the ladder and makes Apple throw our show out to more people and expose us to a bigger audience. So you'd be really be helping us out and we would really, really appreciate it. As I said at the top, we are talking to Matt Harris from Shire Smokers today. Now, you will remember Matt from our first ever After Dark episode at Kangaroo Valley pretty much almost exactly a year ago. Um, I think it was last weekend, uh, a year ago last weekend. Um, he's also very big into Kamado's as well, which we're going to talk about as well. And he's, I can see him shaking his head in the background there. It's Kamado. So I do apologize for that. My pronunciation is terrible. Um, so we're going to ha have a bit of a chat about that as well and also talk about all the different things he does with Shire Smokers. So I think that's about all you need to hear from me. So let's get Matt in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? All righty, Matt, welcome to The Confessional, my friend. How are you today? I'm well. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Very well. Mate, thanks for coming aboard. It is so good to see you again. The last time we actually uh, spoke in person was at Kangaroo Valley, although we um, we did spend quite a bit of time during lockdown on Zoom together with the uh, the different things that we're doing with Smoking Hot Confessions. So, mate, um, what was the last thing that you barbecued? Oh, well, I listened to it after your episodes and I didn't think about that before. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what did I do? Uh, chicken fajitas. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, dare I say it, invested in a, a new barbecue that doesn't operate on fire. Uh, and I'm doing some mixed, smoked, grilled, uh, griddle type cooking now. And I, um, yeah, very happy with it. Very happy with what I did. Interesting, interesting. Is that one of those like um, electric grill top things? No, 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 no. Uh, very similar. Um, it's a flat top, uh, stainless steel's flat top. Very similar to like those Heatleys or Heatlies, uh, Tucker barbecues they're called. Okay, um, yeah, Australia, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Australian made gas barbecue. They're, they're, they're what you'll see at a lot of footy clubs, but they're, uh, a lot of them just burn snags, uh, but they are a, an amazing service to cook on, particularly when you, got, you know, really push for time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can put out a lot of food really quickly and rather than muck it around with two or three pans in the kitchen, I can just go turn it on. But, um, yeah, really enjoying uh, playing around with doing some different stuff and smoking meats and I'm just doing some stuff in the background and I'm playing around with that thing. But chicken fajitas is a go-to for us at our house. Um, we love them. Yeah, so good, man, so good. Now, I usually ask people what barbecue they've got on their back deck, but I know that you're living in an apartment at the moment. So what barbecue do you have on your balcony? 
Um, I'm actually in a townhouse and I've got a courtyard. So, oh, there um, you go. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, space is fairly limited. I do live in a pretty hot, highly den- densely populated place. Well, Sydney generally is. Um, I, I did actually minimise a lot of what I had in the backyard. I had, uh, two, I had two Kamados in the backyard. I had the, the classic, the 18-inch one, and, and the Big Joe, which is the 24. Um, I've decided to minimise my barbecues uh, to make a bit of space for the kids to play around outside. Um, I've got the Kamado, just the Big Joe Kamado now, but I've also got I've got one of every barbecue you'd probably want to play around with. <laughs> so it now gives me the space to drop one in, drop one out and play around with things. But, um, yeah, so um, at the moment we just, uh, as I am saying offline, I sold my house. So looking to get a bigger place, you yeah? So we'll be moving into a bigger place. So maybe I can have a couple more toys actually in the arsenal out. But, uh yeah, I love I love the Big Joe. I love it. I could as that one was the one that I, if I had to choose one, that was the one I had to keep upstairs. Yeah, fair enough. I I uh, don't doubt that for a second. Now, you um you last or well, we we last met up at um at Kangaroo Valley, which I understand is one of your your favourite competitions. Can you tell us a little bit about Kangaroo Valley and and why you love it so much? Well, oh, geez, number of reasons. Uh. I, it was the first one that I competed as Shire Smokers at in the end of 20, I think it was 2016 was the first one. So um, I love getting down there. The Southern Highlands of New South Wales is some, is some beautiful country, uh, very hinterland type. If you've got, if you're familiar with, you know, Northern New South Wales and some of the back of the Gold Coast and what have you, very, very similar in a way. And it's just this beautiful valley that opens up and you can, when you're driving into it, you know, it's a big lake and the pub's just in it. It's just, everything's just easy there. It's just, um, and it, it's just a well-run event. It's I keep really, driving really in and out of there at nighttime when I go down to work at those events and I've never actually noticed the lake. <laughs> oh, poor thing. <laughs> I but when you're idea. driving, it's a, it's pretty hairpinny going down to the valley. So I mean, it, I've had opportunities to be both a passenger and a driver going up and down it over the years. So um, yeah, I've had the luxury of still both. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a pretty cool festival. I I love that it's so family focused. Yeah, it's um there's just so much on for the family. In fact, so much so that uh, this year, 2020, my wife put her foot down and said, "That's it. If you're going to Can- to uh, to Kangaroo Valley again, we're going too." Yeah. Um. The you know the the pig races and the helicopter rides and the ride on lawn mowers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I've taken. I've brought my family down over the years. Um. They usually get accommodation very close nearby. And it's just a bit easier. My kids are very young, um, so I'd love to compete more. Um, but it just it's just one that I've, I'm very comfortable with. And also get out of town for a little bit as well. Um, I love your meat stocks. I love all that other stuff uh, that happens in and around town. It's just I feel like I'm getting away as well, which is nice. And It's, um, it's probably just far enough out of Sydney that it feels like it's a weekend yeah. away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like it, from my place, it only takes an hour 15, so, uh, depending on how much stuff I'm pulling with me and, and what have you. Um, usually I've got a mate. I, I'm pretty, I pretty much do the whole shy smokers thing for solo, but usually I ring in mates who aren't as actively involved in the scene as I am or us, and they tend to give me a hand. Usually I just need someone with a clean set of hands to give me a hand. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good event. And there's... It's a really, really good event. I wasn't able to bring the family down last year, unfortunately, so you didn't get to meet my family. But um, yeah, it's a great event. I, I did meet them the year before, though. Yes, yes, you did. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. That was that was fun. That was good. My yeah, my daughter was two at the time, I think. So, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think that was the last comp when it, when everything was on the one field. So twenty nineteen, yeah. they they'd split it into the two separate fields. Yep, yep. That's it. That's yeah, it. it's very cool. Yeah, and t- tell us about your your track record um, at at Kangaroo Valley. You've uh, picked up a couple of awards, I understand. Yeah, uh, well, the first year I got a third place in chicken. Um, I 
that was, and I was doing uh, lollipops at the time. And it's a very exhaustive process like, to do <laughs> them the way that I do them. Yeah. And there's, 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 there's a fast way to do them and there's a, another way to do them and the other way I do them, uh, quite, quite tenuous. There's a few tools involved. Um, it's worthwhile um, if you can do it right. And it, it's, it's a lot of work. But, um, yeah, I was doing quite well with the chicken there for a while and into the ended up with the first place with it shortly after that. Um, scored a pretty high score with that. It was a rec- it was a record score for a little while that one. But um, that's right, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Out of any category, it was. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. After after about six months, I told everyone what I was doing. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've, um, I, why we won the dessert category down there. I kicked in with a um, with a local girl, Daisy. It's a mate of Sands who runs the event. Um, just. I'm no good at desserts. That's something I think I'd like to get better at. Um, and I got third in pork ribs, which I'm primarily happy about because I think that's the hardest one to win. It is for me too. I'd, I always find pork ribs to be really hard. I always either really underdo them or really overdo them. It's, it's getting the product, getting the right product and only putting in the box what should go in the box, not because you see – Teams putting two racks of ribs in the box, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, um, yeah. but uh, that's ribs. But to be fair, ribs are the thing I cook the most. So, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. So from where you are then, um, I, I had a butcher on the show here uh, a little while ago, um, from East Blacksland Butchers, uh, Scotty. Scotty, do you yeah. do, do, do you work with him? I may have gotten product of him from time to time. Fair enough. Maybe. All righty. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. I like Scotty. I like Scotty a lot. He's not exactly um, convenient for me. Oh, so okay. He's a, so then- yeah. He's a good distance away. But, oh, um, okay. Yeah, he's a good distance away. Um, I, I would love to shop with him a bit more. Um, but, you know, I've got I've got a, a lot of places nearby me and, and one of my partners, the Australian Meat Emporium, that I work with. Uh, that uh, that I that I work with as well, but um, yeah, he's doing some great things up there, isn't he? He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I I haven't heard too much about the um the Australian Meat Emporium. Tell me about them. Well, Australian Meat Emporium's been around a long time. It's gone through a number of n- name changes, but essentially, it's one of these uh, warehouse fridge top spaces that you walk into and you put the jackets on and stuff. Um, a lot of that's changed with COVID. They're not giving out jackets anymore and all that type of thing. And you know, there's all these types of things, but um, the guys at, uh, it was called Establishment 218 once upon a time. They were one of the first places where proper briskets you could get all back sealed up, ready to go. They were one of the first retailers in Sydney. Oh, nice. One of the mm-hmm. pioneers. Yeah, well, they are. They are. I've been shopping. I, I, I conveniently work in that area and I've been shopping there a long time because it's just convenient and I've worked with a lots of other butchers and what have you as well. You know, I'm um, yeah, they approached me and said, look, we'd like to come some, do, do some demos and teach people about barbecue and offer us some advice where we need it. And yeah. Awesome. Sounds like a great partnership there. Yeah, now, that's good. You, you were just mentioning about how they were one of the, um, one of the original brisket suppliers for Sydney. Can you tell us a bit about your origin story about how, about how you got into barbecue? Oh yeah. Um, I, through traveling, I was living overseas. Uh, I was living over, I did a, when I, when I was pushing 30 a little while ago now, uh, um, <laughs> I was living overseas. I was living in London. I moved to Montreal. Um, and it was my eyes were open to grilling again. I think, I think I'm not alone where a lot of our experiences in cooking with fire in Australia with, with the flat plate, fire underneath in a brick kind of thing. You know, I, I grew up with that. Um, Burning gas- sausages and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you know, a good flat plate and just you know, gentle heat underneath type thing. That was my first experience. Or sometimes you had like the grill grates, depending on whose house you were going to like, um, that's, I've always had that passion for it and Weber's over the years and what have you, but it really ignited about well, a good 12 years ago. You know, um, 
to, yeah, be almost 12 years ago now. Um, living over there, seeing ribs, going to barbecue restaurants that were in and around. They're around in North America, but um, when I got back to Australia in 20, late 2010, I was committed to making ribs. I went around hunting to find good ribs, and, um, yeah, I, th- I think there's some guys like me who have got a similar story. You know, there was, it was ribs that got, them, got us going. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got, um, I went, did all the research, you know, I did the paralysis through analysis, and I, I worked out that uh, the one barbecue I needed in a relatively urban environment, I would have loved to have bought an offset smoker when everyone was buying them, but I, I found myself on a Kamado because I felt that it could do everything that I wanted in one barbecue. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I, I, I completely understand that. Now, I just want to loop back to uh, what you're talking about Montreal there. Was there, because um, I understand that you have done a bit of travel through the United States as well. Yep. What what sort of stood out to you about Canadian-style barbecue, particularly Montreal? Because that's uh, that's one of the French-Canadian cities, isn't it? So yeah, correct. Yeah, what, it's in Quebec. What, it's not the capital. Quebec City is the, is the capital. Uh, Montreal is the biggest city in that section. It's like the second biggest city in, North, in Canada. Yeah. Um, bilingual city. Um, when it comes to barbecue, lots of different stuff there. You know, what well, you know, we could we could go on all day about what we consider barbecue and what it means to other people. And uh, when it came comes to uh, that, you know, there's there's a lot of good Portuguese chicken there. Um, there's a lot of good um, American barbecue restaurants now, more so now. Like they they sort of. I feel like they're a bit symbiotic with us and our adaptation of American techniques, but I feel like that's also been a global thing as well. Mm. Everyone communicating a bit more. You're seeing all the Facebook groups and all that sort of thing. But for me, very heavy flavors. Okay. Mm. I find, I find they're very, they love their seasoning. They love their salt. Uh, I've, and I think that's general for North America as well. I think that a lot of people that are outside of our barbecue scene and competitions and stuff would uh, find it very confronting, a lot of the flavours, very bold. Okay. But, yeah. but I enjoy it. I think it's great. That's really interesting what you said about the um, about those flavors up in up in Montreal. There, in in my travels through the lower states in the in the US, I found that the the French settled regions, you know, your your Cajun, your Creole, they're really punchy flavors. Is that the sort of thing that you found up in Quebec? Are they similar to those sort of uh, the you know the the US style Cajun and Creole uh, flavor profiles? Within those those communities, yeah, you've got a lot of uh, people from Martinique there and and, and the Caribbean. Uh, yes, you will see a lot of that. You'll see a lot of jerk chicken. You'll see a lot of all that sort of stuff. Um, as for uh, Quebecois food, it's very winter orientated. Oh, just of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just generally, um, so it's very French in a way, but very its own thing. So heavy sauces, liver, duck is one of the duck is one of the big things there. Okay. Um, a lot of a lot of North America's ducks come from Quebec. Um, goose, a lot of that sort of stuff as well. And they've got some pretty good lamb there too for North America. Oh, that's interesting. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it's um yeah, they they they've got a got a bit of a lot of things up there, you know. And uh yeah, that's that's my experience. But the thing that I think a lot of people will really get on board with is the pastrami. Ooh. Smoke meat, they call it. Bien for me. Um, it's just ba- it's basically like um, you know your uh, New York pastrami. So uh, they have they've got a very big Jewish population there, similar to how there is in in and around New York, um, and they do that's where their briskets go to. So they're brine corning briskets, everything sliced with a knife, stacked high. White rye bread, American mustard. That's it. Sounds amazing. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So that was one of the things when I got back to Australia that I wanted to eventually get into. But uh, 
found myself doing all sorts of other things, you know, you know uh, ribs and all sorts of other things. So, yeah. Hi there, Ben from Meat and Fire Media Services here where we help your business put the meat on the table. Social media. For some, these two words strike terror in their hearts. Everybody says if businesses aren't on social media, then they are missing out. But where do businesses even start? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, TikTok, so many others. All the different platforms, the different audiences, the different algorithms, it can be very intimidating and incredibly overwhelming. There can be so much to think about, it's hard to know where to even begin. As a result, a lot of businesses end up in a kind of stress paralysis and doing nothing. And if they're doing nothing, then they're not gonna be making any sales. A system is what's needed to make sense of all of this. A system that can be easily implemented for any business and ensure engagement with potential customers. A system that establishes a business as an authority in the field. A system that is easy to follow and includes tools to make a business owner's life easier and maximize leverage from the time taken to put it into place. Our course, Brand Building Through Strategic Media Marketing, is that system. This is the exact process that we use to take our sister company, Smoking Hot Confessions, from an idea on the couch in suburban Australia to award-winning barbecue media outlet recognized by industry bodies in the United States. We have a step-by-step -step system laid out in detail, lists of various online tools that we use, and lessons in how to use those tools. We kick things off with an explanation of the different platforms out there to help businesses select the right platform for them based on their audience demographics, content type, and then matching that with their own strengths. We then take them on a tour of their existing audience to mine useful data to ensure maximum impact of their new strategies. And finally, we take businesses through the step-by-step -step process needed to build their own social media marketing system that builds their brand targeting exactly the right follower and future customers. We even have exclusive Facebook groups where they'll join a community of like-minded business owners who are all going through the same journey. To get started today, click through to our website, enroll, and I'll see you in there. Alrighty now, so let's jump into the second segment, and I really want to talk about Shire Smokers, because um, you do a whole bunch of different stuff under that under that one banner. So let's kick things off with the, with the competitive team. Can you tell us a bit about... Um, at what point you decided to take your Kamado from your courtyard and take it out to a pit yard and sort of throw your hat in the ring? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've been competing before I started Shire Smokers. I was uh, competing with a friend of mine, Ken, uh, Big Dog Barbecue. He's one of the original Aussie barbecue teams. Uh, we've competed, we competed at the very first meat stock together. Um, He's from the Central Coast. We met each other via Kurt. Uh, Kurt hit, yeah. Kurt yep. from Fastlane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And um, introduced ourselves. We actually kind of knew each other from an old message board. That was a barbecue message board from many, many years ago. A uh, forum? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Aussie, uh, Aussie barbecue. I, I can't remember the website address. It's still there. <laughs> it's still there. It's okay. still there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of the, the that's, uh, it was, it was a place where a lot of, of the original barbecue guys met. Jay was on it. Adam was on it. Everyone was on it. Michael Rose, all those guys were all on that board. And it was, uh, you know, Wes was on it years ago when we, and it became, I, I feel like that was a very important piece of his Aussie barbecue history for Definitely. what it is now. Um, and yeah, so did a bit of that. That was sort of late 2015. When was the first meat stock? I think it was early 2015. Or was it early 2017? Oh, you got me. You got me. Oh, I want to say 2016 actually. Because mm. 2017. Do your own research, everyone. Yeah, I, um, I'm, 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 I'm going to say 2016 because 2017, I was excited to go to my first meat stock, which was Melbourne which would have been in March 2017. So I'm going to say the first meat stock would have been 2016. Yeah. Welcome to but the history was, lesson with Matt and Ben. Yeah, there was, <laughs> there, was a weird, there was a weird thing because the first meat stock was in like a February and then it took a long time for Jay to be able to get the next one organised because he wanted to have it in a cooler time of year. That's why it's now in May. Yep. Because um, never again, never again. It was... <laughs> I, I don't, uh, that, 
I can't remember I think, who won that year. I think it was Saffron won it that year. Yep. And very, very well deserved. I think the heat might have been what sort of has 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 pushed out that um, Parramatta Australia Day competition as well. Yeah, yeah. Because I've heard that that was pretty brutal too. Yeah, we find we find you'll find in North America they stop when it snows, and we should stop when it when it's really hot. Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's just you know it's it's not right. You know, to be doing barbecue comps in December, January, and into early February, it's. I think that's I think that's why I like. Um, Kangaroo Valley, I guess it's a good challenge because everyone's been competing all year. You know, they've honed their skills and all that type of thing. You know, so yeah. So Shire Smokers then went to Kangaroo Valley, first one in 2016. I was f- trying to formulate how I would go about it, um, asking a bunch of people. Spoke to Michael Rose and I said, "What do you reckon I call this thing?" And he's like, "Call it Sutherland Smokers." And I went, "You know what?" That's what I'm going to call. It. I'm going to call it Shire Smokers. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of lot of teams popping up, and um, everyone had their names. And I wanted I wanted to have a point of reference for my community, somewhere to come that they could, uh, yeah, get behind or uh, see or come to for barbecue advice. Yeah, well, that sort of brings me to my um, to my second point that I've written down here uh, is that you also do lessons and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, um, with the help of the Smoky Barbecue Bandits, Geezer and Ruby, two of my very good mates, um, we did some, uh, I think it was 2017, it's early 2017, just going back a bit now. Uh, can't remember. I always get the 2016 and 2017 mixed up with what I was doing at around that time and 2015. Um, yeah, we put together uh, some barbecue classes at my old rugby club at Southern Districts Rugby Club. Uh, just put it out there on the local community groups. We thought, oh, let's just throw it out there and see what happens. We've got 30 tickets snapped up real quickly. Nice. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You know, we were learning at the same time uh, how to present, what to teach, how to teach. Uh, but um, uh, we did, similarly to your uh, book, that your little book you put out, a very similar process that we followed back then um, in what we were trying to achieve and what we were trying to teach. You know, we're teaching how to trim cuts of meat. You know, lots of, we were throwing lots of things out there. My, my classes are very reasonably priced. And uh, working with, uh, we were working with Emu as well. Uh, he's one of the original rub producers in our, in our scene. And, uh, yeah, we just put it all together. And from there, it's usually a yearly thing that I'll do locally. And it's usually mates and mates of mates and, and just, just via word, you know. So then I was after that that the Australian Meat Emporium got in touch with me. Uh, they realised that I was going off on my own back, booking venues, doing my own thing, you know. Uh, and, um, yeah, I just... I just apply the principles that I've learned through work on how to teach as well, you know, um, keeping things very super. I call it kiss barbecue. It's the best way, mate. The best way. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, so too. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious because you've, you've talked about bringing in some, um, some, some, some partners on your lessons to, to, to help out with that. But when it comes to competing, you prefer to compete solo. Why, why is the, the difference there? Um, cause I've only got myself to blame. <laughs> <laughs> is that, is that AKA a control thing? Uh, a cause bit. I know it is for me. It is for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put that out there. Like I'm not having a go. It, no, I, no, 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 it, no. It's a, the same a for bit, me. A bit. Um, I just find with the amount of time that I, uh, I've spent cooking, I'm very confident in my, in my skills. Yep. Um, you know, look, if, it, if I don't win, I don't win. But if I make something and I'm happy with, I'm good. You know, so I, I take a different, uh, I, th- I think it was something Sterling said to me years ago. It was like, cook with love, you know. And I was like, okay, I'm going to treat like cooking for the judges like I'm cooking for my family. Okay, and that's, that's a different part. approach. Yeah, that's, a, that's just, just how I go about it. Like a, a lot of the techniques are quite similar. There's certain things and injections and stuff I don't use. I just, if I was competing more, maybe I would use those, but I just, 
for me, um, when it comes to solo cooking, I think people tend to overcomplicate the process. Like, oh, okay, sure. If it comes down to two perfectly cut uh, cooked pieces of meat and one's using an injection, it may get ahead. Yeah, yeah. But I don't cook without stuff at home. So when I go to the comps two or three times a year, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cook with that product. So I'm yeah. taking the error factors out of that because good barbecue oh, is, because okay. I feel good barbecue is process driven when it comes to competing. Yep. I, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that you're not going to introduce those uh, classical competition ingredients at a competition when you haven't been using them in, in, in your reps at home. Yeah, correct. And your repetitions at home. Exactly. You know, gotcha. like oh, if I had time to compete, uh, to uh, practice rather, sure, different story. You know, uh, I think you'll, you'll see um, the guys who have been competing quite a bit will have their techniques down and that a lot of them practice and repeat. They'll say, I don't practice. It's like, well, you also do 10, time, 10 comps a year, you know. Maybe, um, you know, I'm just shooting from the hip, you know. they they get opportunities to try those things or use those products or, you know, when they practice as well, you know, but the young family is quite difficult for me personally to be able to do that. So just trying to, just try and keep the arrows out that way. If you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. I'm, I'm the same way up here. Plus, I mean, you've, you've just got a fourth one now as well, but uh, my, my family's only three. So oh, I've got two. You know, well, it's four, oh, so, four in the family. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, so I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to cook 40 briskets in a year as, as practice. Um, you know, we, I, I load up my radar hill here. I cook two, two briskets and I fill up the other two drawers with, you know, pork butts and lamb shoulders and all that sort of stuff. And that's it. I, I fill the freezer for the next three months mm. and it'll be three or four months before I, before I go and get some more at, at, as well. So I could completely understand, uh, where you're coming from there. Yeah. Oh, well, that was why, that was why chicken was a strong category for me because it was cheap and easy to practice. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Pork ribs quite similarly. You know, yeah, and yeah. certain cuts of lamb are easy to to practice with your family and and what have you as well. You know, um, I think a lot of people in the comp scene. I mean, look, I'm not looking at every box, but based upon the conversations I'm having, is they're trying to put too much stuff in the box. I've I've noticed that the last sort of two years as well. I'm sort of doing the math in my head as because I I now spend a lot of time photographing in the in the judges' tents and um, I see these boxes come through and say say we're talking about lamb. You've got you got some some lamb shoulder in there. You got some rack. You got some rib. I'm looking at that box going. That's hundred and fifty dollars minimum. Yep. Worth of meat in that box. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yep. So then, you know, you've, you've got to get all those three or four cuts that are in that box. You've got to get them all perfect Correct. all the time. So there's a ton of practice and a ton of money that's gone into getting that box presentation worthy. Well, can you imagine um, how good the box, I think it was Tony's team, they got the perfect score, they had the four or five cuts in it. Beard in the barbecue, yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine how good it would have been? It, it would have been, been sensational. It would yeah, have been yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, how hard that is to do as a one solo person? Very. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd much rather, yeah, look, it, it's a crap, it's a bit, and everyone knows it's a bit of a crab shoot as well. You know, just, just taking, taking the error factor out, you know? Yeah. I'd much yeah. rather put a perfect uh, rack of lamb in there than one that's a little bit over or a little bit under that judges aren't going to like and okay ribs or okay pool. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, if, you're not, if, I, if I'm not happy with it and I'm not going to serve too much of it to my friends and family, I'm going to continue to cook it on the barbecue, I'm not going to pull it off the, off the pit. No, nah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to bring up was um, the charity work that you do with Shire Smokers, uh, sort of looping back to Kangaroo Valley again. Um, you do the, the, the Devon competition, and I know I haven't got the name of that exactly right. <laughs> Devin Fritz show. I forgot all. I didn't think you were going to bring this up. I didn't even think about it. <laughs> Devin Fritz and Poloni Appreciation Society competition. That's it. That's it. That's it. Tell us a bit about that and how that works. Do you want to? Do you want to know? Do you want to know the history behind it? And how? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you can. 
A pretty funny story. Um, crafted, uh, and this is another one of those solo barbecue things, right? You know, I did, I did have, Kurt was cooking with me that day uh, from Fast Lane. And there was a chef's choice category, but it didn't go towards the GC. And I saw all these, uh, uh, and I heard murmurs that all these guys had these wonderful ideas of stuff that they were going to do. And the things that people were putting out that day were incredible. I saw some stuff online, a little bit about what they call it, uh, Oklahoma tenderloin, bologna. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Mississippi ribeye. Is Mississippi it, it, ribeye, that's the yeah, thing they call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's quite popular now. It is, actually, You know, but yeah. it wasn't in 20, 20, early 2017, you know. There wasn't no, a lot no. of content online about it, but I was like, I, I, was, I was mucking around at home and with a couple of mates and I had a bit of drink and I thought, oh, Let's go go up the road. I'll grab a I'll grab a log of Devon and see what I can do with it. Oh. <laughs> and uh, if you know Kurt well, right? He uh, he'll try anything once, and he's got he's if the, if you ever wanted dining advice, he's the kind of guy I would go to. You know, he's 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 got his finger on the pulse with a lot of that stuff. And I made so basically in my box, I made. Um, uh, Devon and uh, so, smoked Devon and sauce sandwiches. I cut like a, a club sandwich style. Oh, okay. I had, that I had slices and I made Devon burn ends down the bottom in ah. like squares. So it looks like it looks like a proper, it actually looked like a proper barbecue bo- like hand turn in box. Yeah, yeah. And I was walking up to hand it in and I passed it. The Shankies were um, looking after it that day. I was like, I was like, hey, Mikey, Ralphie, do you want to see an Aussie barbecue first, mate? And they're like, what? I go, smoke Devon. And they're like, Mikey just looked at his head and just go, you're off your head, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took a photo of it. It was put up on the a, uh, in the ABA group and it caused a funeral. It really kicked <laughs> off. It really uh, it divided everyone. It really upset. There were judges whining about it that had to try it. And, if you know me well, I love taking the piss. Uh, yeah. I just I love making fun. Like it was for me, it was like I cannot spend the time on the chef's choice category and take it seriously. But I'm not going to not hand something in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I thought it was funny. Everyone else around me were like, "That's the best thing I've ever seen. That is punk rock. Good on you." Like, um, so it caused such a fear. It caused such a fear. I was divided. Opinion. Everyone was like, "That's the funniest thing I've ever seen." And then uh, we started. Uh, uh, I think the very next um, Port Macquarie Barbecue Wars was shortly in the middle of that year. Was that the one where where I was next door to you, or, no. or maybe I was one was down that? from you? No. Yes. Yeah. It was that year we did Port do Mac, it at- Port Mac twenty seventeen. Yes, 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 yes. It was 2017. I think I did it at the meat stock the year before and it was sort of like, yeah, it was about 15 people. It was a bit of fun and we had a trophy and I basically, I don't know if you've ever seen them, there's those squeezed pigs. I oh, yeah, three yeah. Of them and I've got text to it. I was like, complete, complete uh, mucking around. Um, so you started up like a little side comp at the, yeah, at the main yeah, comps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just got funnier and funnier. And the, guy, the things guys were making like, it's basically Devon art almost in a way. And it's just, it, it's just got way out of hand now. <laughs> then come, come uh, that 2017, I hit Jay up and I said, Jay, um, do you mind if I use the judges tent to do this competition? Cause I've got a little bit what, too many people. Cause I, I was just going to do it at, at my site. He goes, yeah, mate, no worries. You want a microphone and all this? I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. And then uh, things went awry on the microphone. I've got a big, deep voice, so I got away with it. But and it was something like 20 to 30 teams had like put, <laughs> made up Devon. I remember it. It was huge. That, yeah, it was that, huge. that yeah. marquee was full. Yeah, the marquee was full of everyone. And uh, me and Ruby and Giza were uh, from, Ruby and Giza from Smoky Bandits uh, were hosting it. Just to, and everyone had come down. It was like our you know, get together pretty much. And it was, it, it was a good way to like have a laugh together. So it's all open box format. So 10 bucks entry goes to a charity, um, it, whoever it is, wherever we are. And I think that year, I think Linda from Highland Q had a, 
um, a charity she was working with. Q, Q for a cause. I think she was working with a women's Some, shelter yeah, based on the Mid North Coast. There. Yeah, yeah. It's been a, it's been a few beers since then, Benny. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that's the main thing with it. And that, uh, to see you got to see it again down at Kangaroo Valley, and it's gone to a yeah. It's uh, some of the things that some things are funny. Some things are like serious. Some of the things that have come out are, are just in, incredible. People are dehydrating things, making chips out of them. Nico made Nico from Scotch and Smoke made like uh, shot glasses. Yeah, like he whittled away shot glasses, and Gabriel was like, "Oh, cool! I'll take my shot." I was like, "No, you got to do the chaser, mate." From the <laughs> <judges>. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You know? So, what are some of the um, some of the more creative hand ins that you've seen with that uh, with that little Devon comp? Oh, tacos, um, deep fried things, um, deep uh, fried Pluto, Devon Pluto, Pluto, Pluto pops. Okay, I can see uh, that. Dagwoods, one. Yeah. sorry, you know, um, corn dogs for the American uh, corn dogs. Listeners. Yep, yep, corn yep. dogs. Um, trying to think what else you 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 think of anything that's out there? Oh. Devon Choi Bao instead of San Choi Bao. Yep. Chopped up in lettuce cups. Like, it really is a great vehicle. It doesn't really taste, the food. Devon doesn't really taste like much. It's like bits and pieces, you know, like there's so many things that you can, you can take it. You know, people made burgers and burn ends. And um, then again, it's, you know, it's judged on um, appearance, taste, and um, uh, what's the other thing? Uh, creativity. So, like, creativity is like the weighted score. So, if you've done something that's really funny, good chance you're in the running to win. It's it's a rabble. It's a, it's a yeah, complete yeah, yeah. kangaroo court, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd Ben Arnott. All righty, now, Matt, let's get into Kamados themselves. Now, as you are the Kamado guy, and you also have, I believe it's the biggest Kamado group in Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, on, on Facebook. It is the Kamado owners of Australia and New Zealand. If you're watching or listening to this and you are, you're a Kamado owner or you're thinking about getting into one, go check out that Facebook group. It's a great group. Um, so I don't have one. I've never cooked on one. So walk me through whatever I would need to know about cooking on a Kamado. Well, Kamado is a really efficient cooker. Ceramic grills we're talking about right now. They're, I mean, there's a couple of different types of Kamados. There's metal ones, um, uh, aluminium ones, and ceramic ones. Um, when we're talking about Kamados, I think we should talk about the ceramic ones. Um, Why do you well, prefer the ceramic ones? Well, I, because I've never really owned one of the others, to be oh, okay. honest. Well, um, the, the ceramic ones are the more traditional ones too, aren't they? Correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So they're basically an ancient grill from Japan and China, originally uh, uh, rice cookers, but uh, effectively they're um, a, a bastardization of those. Ex-servicemen from World War II took them back to America and you know, companies like Big Green Egg and you now Kamado Joe came out of that. So... The beautiful thing about cooking with ceramics is the amount of char- the amount of fuel that you use. It's quite minimal. I mean, I'm no greenie by any strength of the means, but my my costs in using charcoal are quite minimal. It's you know, there's a lot of guys that in barbecue that have got sponsorships with charcoal, and um, I'll try I'll try anything. You know, um. I'll work, with, I'll work with brands and stuff, but uh, I find that it's more trouble than it's worth because of how much I use. Whilst the cookers are quite expensive, you know, I, I feel over a year or two, you get that money back. Mm. In, say Compared to, say, a bullet smoker or a pro or a Fernando bullet or a Weber Smoky Mountain. Okay. Similar sort yep. of process to those, in answer to your question, in the way that you would light those up, very similar. Very similar. Um, it just depends on what sort of style you're cooking. You know, you can do everything on the Kamado. It's not necessarily the best smoker, but it's definitely, if you had to pick uh, high temp cooking, pizzas, 
uh, low and slow barbecue, hot and fast barbecue, ro- and just general roasting and cooking with fire, it's the best cooker that does all of those things efficiently, I find. Yeah, so right, send, okay. So you set them up, little fire in the middle, deflector plate on top, you're cooking indirect. Some of the Kamado Joe started playing and uh, the Primo brand started playing around with split deflectors so you can have one side on, one side off. We were seeing a lot of the deflectors that you can get for weathers and all sorts of stuff now, quite similar in idea. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the amount of fuel you use, and it's like cooking in the ground, so if you've ever been, if you're ever familiar with the way Polynesians and Melanesians cook in the ground, um, like, um, hungies and type, type of thing, you get a similar kind of, I find you get a similar sort of thing going on with it as well. But, um, yeah, I, I just love them. I, minimal, <clears throat> very easy to achieve that thin blue smoke on them. Very clean way to cook on them. Um, yeah, I just, I just think they're the best of the bunch to, for your home cooking. Now, so, I, I, I've got a lot of different grills, but if I had, if my wife had a gun and said, give you can keep one. That's one I'm keeping. <laughs> Fair I won't enough. be able to compete, <laughs> but because I've got a yeah, difficult to move. But yeah, you. I, I was going to ask about that because they um being uh being terracotta or or, or ceramic that there'd be quite a lot of weight in them. So yeah, it is it it is it a case of you need to know where you want to set it up before you unpack it and set it up because once it's done, it's done. Yeah, uh, they are relatively movable when you've got the um. When you got the stand, um, they are heavy. I am, oh, you know me well, Benny. I'm I'm a pretty big guy, so moving a <clears throat> one of the classic uh, Kamados is not a difficult feat for me. It's not easy either. But it's not undoable. Um, it's it's pretty good once you get it set somewhere. Like they're very. They're very good at working in all sorts of environments because they're so insulated. It's like cooking in the ground. Um, yeah, 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 you're not very susceptible to temperature changes and swings because of like external factors like uh, weather, rain. Rain will affect it a bit, but rain will affect every cooker. Yeah, it will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're pretty solid. You know, there's all these little contraptions for them and little, you know, flame loss or, um, you know, um, the I command they've got, um, you know, that control the temp. I, I mean, after cooking on one for a long time, I don't, I don't need them. Uh, right. But uh, very, very easy to learn and navigate for the beginner, I find, uh, temperature control and having a clean fire. Yeah. So... The um, you're mentioning about how how little charcoal it uses. So on an average brisket cook, if you say I don't know eight to ten hours for for a brisket, I don't know if you're doing the turn and burn or if you're um going more more traditional lower temperatures. But what sort of what sort of kiloage would you estimate of charcoal you're going through on a on a brisket cook? I cook a bit differently to a lot of people when I'm cooking on my Kamado, say a brisket. Um, I've got a combination of um sort of the hot and fast and flip type thing. <clears throat> but the okay. heat source being, I've, everyone else, had, yeah, well, I mean, without going in that discussion, fat side up or down, fat side yep. down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I find, um, and I feel, I feel this is the same for any cooker out there, point your point towards the heat. It's basically my motto to it. So I'll do this. Uh, like a Wagyu, a bubble score Wagyu brisket, like a five to seven, which is what a lot of people I think are cooking out there or trying to, uh, about a seven hour cook. I'll probably use, uh, because I cook at about 300. Okay. But I might back it off if it's not, if it's like an Angus or it's a little bit less uh, fat mm-hmm. in it. I'll yep. back it back to 275. That much. Okay, well, probably two or three kilos. Not even. All oh, right. Okay, that's not cool. much. Yeah, not much at all for that long. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, it's a pretty big cooker. It's a pretty big piece of meat. It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like yeah. you would probably, you know, eight to ten hours, like for a bullet smoker. You know, you might be using briquettes a bit more to like be a bit more dense and what have you. I like the airflow. I like lump charcoal. 
Uh, but but there's plenty. Once you've cleared the ash out, there's still plenty left over. Yeah, yeah. I'll re- yeah. And you can reuse it quite well. And it's really easy to do with all the baskets that are in Komodos. Just shake them out. Off you go. It's so good cooking with ceramics. There's so much less cleaning. Why is that? I don't know. It's something about the ceramics, they tend to breathe a bit. Um, and once you've caught your grease, the way to get rid of it is to set it on fire. Now, as long as there's not too much of it. <laughs> well, well we, we call it a high temp burn. Yeah, right. Like yeah, we'll cook yeah. a pizza or do a steak. Yep. You clean the, bar- the barbecue's clean. Yeah, right. That's you interesting. Know, whereas I find grease on metal surfaces tends to stick a little bit more, and you really, you really do, you really have to clean a metal barbecue. I don't buy into any of that stuff. It's like, oh, it's seasons. Like, I don't want bad fat fires in there. Some of no, look, um, I've I've nearly um nearly burnt my house down twice because I've been a bit lazy about cleaning the grease out of metal barbecues, and it just up it goes. That on your food. You don't want no. that on your food. It was something t- like a t- Tuffy's big behind it. And I'm, I really look to him for guidance and I really like his way of teaching and the way he talks about stuff and, you know, uh, yeah. It's also a great way of producing consistent barbecue. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, if you're not cooking, if your thing's not as, if your thing's clean all the time, you're going to cook the same thing the same way each time. You're not going to have external variables of yeah yeah, bits of last week's cook falling off onto your brisket and yeah 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 all righty so um i i I guess the last thing that i want to ask you about kamados then is um what are some some tricks or or techniques that we need to be aware of so i've i've heard of burping are there are there other sort of different uh nuances to kamado cooking that we need to be aware of leave it alone okay just leave it alone don't, don't, don't temperature watch. But I think that could be same for all barbecues, right? Uh, within reason, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't chase temps. Going over, it's hard to settle it back down compared to other cookers. Like if I was using my drum, if I went up, if I overshoot, it's easy to get it back down because I can just cool it down. Whereas once the ceramics are hot, they're hot. Don't chase temps, you know, you set them up to go. But even then, like... So you're going to start small and build then. Yeah, build then, you know, and then once you've overshot, it's hard to get it back down. But if you overshoot, set the vents. If the fire's clean, throw it on. You can make it up in the long run. As long as, as, long as you're not getting any dirty smoke going on your food, you should be good to go. You know, we nice. want airflow, good airflow through it, making sure that you're not just packing in charcoal. I think you'll find with other cookers like bullet smokers and stuff, I find personally briquettes don't breathe enough because there's not enough airflow to get through them. It's just a personal thing. Other people might have techniques. You see a lot of guys doing snakes in bullets and all sorts of things. So why not just use on charcoal? Just easier. It's already got the airflow through it. I, I go for rees when it comes to that sort of stuff. So good airflow like any other barbecue. But, um, yeah, it just just relax and let it, let it do its thing. You can always catch it up in the resting techniques, you know. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Well, look, that's probably a good point for us to start uh, wrapping up this episode. So uh, give us uh, uh, some some shout outs, people that have helped you along the way and tell everybody where they can track you down on the internet. Too many people to thank. Too many people to make yourself. I think I think what you do with the Aussie barbecue scene is fantastic, mate. Thank you. you know, I think a lot of people would have learned off you or been able to have a chance to talk about stupid stuff like Devin. <laughs> You know, uh, I think a lot of the original barbecue guys that were out there, you know, I think we well, always got to take our hat off to all those guys. Uh, everyone who encouraged me back in the early days, Weber Kettle Boys, uh, Bardas, um, you know, Ken from Big Dog, um, just everyone that was around at that time, you know. Um, you know, all the butchers that are out there, love your stuff, you know, Shannon, that you had on the podcast the other day, Georgie, you know, you know, you can't, can't go past Jay trying to do what he's doing, pushing the Aussie barbecue as well. Everyone, like everyone's had their hand in it. Yeah. yeah. You know? And um, that's, and we are where we are and you and I are able to catch up and put a podcast. You're able to put a podcast out there because, because a lot of people have been there. So everyone, thank you, I guess. 
Um, you can find me on Facebook at, at Shire Smokers BBQ on Instagram, Facebook, and also on the Kamado Owners of Australia and New Zealand Facebook page. Awesome, man. Well, that sounds absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been great to, to learn about Shire Smokers and and your your journey and in particular about Kamados because that is that, I think that's the only style of barbecue I don't have, oh I, I I don't have a pellet and I don't have a Kamado. Get a I Kamado. I've, I think I've got everything else. <laughs> Just get one. Everyone everyone who's got one ends up uh yeah, everyone who's got one. Yeah, like there's Dan, Dan Rollins from you know remember Smoking Hot Bros. He's got one. He loves it. And he he was he was an offset man all the way. You know, like there's some pretty there's a lot of guys turning to him now. And uh, yeah, that's it's good for the family barbecue, I reckon. Beautiful man, beautiful. Well, look, thanks very much for coming on board the show, and I wish you the best of luck in 2021. Hopefully, we can get back out to some competitions real soon. Absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thanks very much, Ben. Alrighty, family, there you have it. That was Matt Harris from Shire Smokers Barbecue. How funny is that guy? That Devon competition, I've uh, I've witnessed I've witnessed that personally twice now. That is absolutely hilarious. If you get a chance to to check that out, do so. Um, just beware of Matty Stoughton's hand ins though. He, uh, he gets a little bit naughty anyway. Um, that was, uh, absolutely fantastic to have him on board. I'm going to have to go and investigate some Kamado options now. Um, don't, don't tell my wife, uh, <laughs> I'll be a dead man. You won't see me on here again. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go check it out because that was really cool, really interesting stuff. So before I let you go, I just want to just uh, quickly say again, big thank you to our podcast partner for today, Meat and Fire Media Services. If you do run a barbecue business and you are looking for someone who understands both barbecue and the world of digital media, do check them out. They do have that course available at the moment, 100 bucks off. Use the code word podcast and you will uh, be able to get into that real quick. Um, there is a free ebook available for you on our website, smokinghotconfessions.com. It is the beginner's guide to real barbecue. Head on over to the website, have a trawl around there. A pop-up window is going to appear. Put your details in. We'll shoot it through to you. And do come and join me and uh, and Matt and many others at the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Community on Facebook. Uh, we have a zero tolerance on rubbish. So all that other guff is left at the door and we just talk about barbecue and hang out and have a good time and everybody's welcome. Uh, We don't care where you're from or what you cook on just as long as you enjoy meat and fire. So uh, yeah, do come and join us there. If you are watching on YouTube, do give us a thumbs up, a subscribe and hit that little notification bell. If you're watching it on Facebook, give us a like and a share. And if you've got any questions for Matt or I, pop them in the comments. Instagram TV, we do love those cute little hearts. Give us a follow as well. And if you're listening on a podcast app, especially if you're listening on an Apple device, please do take two minutes, give us a five-star rating and review. It's going to tell Apple that you love the show, you think other people should love the show and that they should show the show two more people. I don't know how many more times I can get the word show into one sentence. (laughs) Anyway, I think that is enough for me. So I'm going to say thank you very much. And until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions.